Google search will reveal that Kenneth Kidd is adored by his students for his openness and helpfulness. And having had the chance to interact with him myself, I can confirm these traits. He is one of the easiest people to talk to and kept offering to help us prep yesterday despite being our guest. So we are lucky to have him with us today. Kenneth Kidd is Professor and Chair of English at the University of Florida, where he also serves as Associate Director of the Center for Children's Literature and Culture. His publications include Making American Boys, Boyology and the Feral Tale, Freud and Oz at the Intersections of Psychoanalysis in Children's Literature, and co-edited collections on eco-criticism and queer children's literature. At present, he is co-editing Prizing Children's Literature and working on a monograph entitled Theory for Beginners. Kenneth is a longtime member of the Children's Literature Association, and from 2004 to 2014, he was the associate editor of CHLA Quarterly. Please join me in welcoming our keynote, Kenneth. Thank you. Can you guys uh, hear me okay? Am I too loud? That's quite possible. No, okay. Um, so thank you very, very much. It's great to it's great to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here at the conference. Um, I want to thank Suzanne and Jan and the graduate students who have made this um, incredible event possible. Um, I, the readings and uh, talks this morning were, were fabulous. It's kind of hard to follow them, to be honest. Um, really, really um, fascinating work. So thank you for the hospitality and your, and your graciousness. Um, <laughs> um, I, I will be, I, I posted a picture of the flyer um, with the conference theme on it, and several people said, oh, I love the title of your talk. Um, I said, actually, that's the title of the conference, and it is a great title. Um, I, I will be traveling through time, I hope, um, uh, fast enough for you. And through um, <laughs> the, the parallel worlds, uh, worlds of children's literature and, and queer theory, my, my, uh, my particular topic uh, is children's literature or queer theory um, for children. And I do have some, um, some images which uh, sadly won't come for a few pages, but if you can hang on, they, they will eventually be there and be just a welcome distraction, I'm sure. <laughs> um, okay, so my talk today is a sequel to a short piece I published in PMLA um, called Queer Theories, Child, and Children's Literature Studies. And there I argue that while children's literature scholars have been equipped to mobilize queer theory, queer theorists have largely ignored children's and young adult literature, and especially in the study of it. Um, even as they've lately gotten excited about the child. This asymmetry, um, I wrote, is unfortunate because children's literature is both normative and queer in interesting ways. I can the please by asking, and I'm actually quoting myself here, which I realize is just a little narcissistic. Um, <laughs> can, can, can children's literature be positioned as already a queer theory of sorts? End quote. That's the idea I want to explore. Um, more of a thought experiment than a rigorous argument. Children's literature as queer theory. And in my view, queer theorists should turn to children's literature not merely because it's good source material, uh, but because it constitutes a form of queer theory in its own right. We uh, routinely bring theory close to literature when we write literary criticism. Why not also bring literature, including children's literature, close to theory and think about how it might function as theory? The idea that children's literature might be theoretical isn't new. There are hints of such in all kinds of work, including some psychoanalytic criticism, as well as a good bit of structuralist theory. Moreover, um, the philosophy for children, or P4C movement, which some of you may be familiar with, um, which is actually often now called PWC, philosophy with children, um, that movement that started in the early 1970s has turned increasingly to children's literature, not so much as subject matter to be worked on or over, but as a kind of parallel discourse and exemplary practice. And of course, children's literature scholars have lately been emphasizing the confluence of postmodernism in various genres for children, in particular the picture book and the young adult novel. The metafictiveness of these genres seems nearly a form of social and intellectual engagement approaching the philosophical or theoretical, uh, or even the ethical, as some have, have argued. Observers in the more popular press make similar sort of pronouncements or points, as with, for example, uh, Veneca Cruz's 2014 piece, it's a short piece, in the Atlantic um, entitled Postmodernism for Kids. Uh, Lemony Snicket's series of unfortunate events, Cruz explains, was, quote, her first introduction to postmodern literature, end quote. And I like to concede of a first introduction, since postmodernism demands many, if not endless, introductions. And she clarifies, quote, it was the book's style, as much as the content, that I found most compelling of all, end quote. She means the series playful and effectiveness and intense intertextuality and so forth. 
in the most recent issue of The Line of the Unicorn. Um, and at Wanamaker, likewise, suggests that um, John Teller's Why Eat Now Will Nothing, um, published in 2000, is, quote, as much a work of philosophy or critical theory as it is a work of fiction, that perhaps these genres have a great deal more in common than is often acknowledged, unquote. Literary theories more generally have emphasized the overlap um, of or fuzziness between theory and literature. Literature, writes Jonathan Teller, for example, is always already in theory and theory in literature. Teller proposes, quote, that what has happened to the literary in theory is that it has migrated from being the object of theory to being the quality of theory, end quote. If theory helped to displace the place of literature in the academy and in society as some worry, not arguing that that's the case, theory has also helped, um, quoting Teller again, quote, to locate a literariness in cultural objects of all sorts, and thus to retain a certain centrality of the literary, end quote. The reciprocity of theory and literature is obviously no less marked in children's literature. There's no shortage, of course, of applications of queer theory to children's literature. You probably have some favorite examples. There's also no shortage of queer theories of children's literature. We might even say that most, if not all, theories of children's literature are queer, or at least have queerish tendencies, to the extent that they challenge received knowledge about children's literature, sometimes even dealing with issues of gender uh, and or sexuality. All of this is true of Jacqueline Rose's, the case of Peter Pan, queer theory in many ways, complicated ways, and also Perry Nittleman's 2008 sort of quasi-revision of Rose, The Hidden Adult, which in certain sections actually applies queer theory, specifically Sedgwick, to children's literature. Tyson Pugh and Nat Hurley um, were recently engaged uh, and, and more explicitly engaged with queer theory, offering their own queer theories of children's literature, and also neither of them quite identifying as a children's literature specialist, which is sort of a, maybe a, top, a separate topic, but an interesting one as well. Um, but no one has talked about children's literature as queer theory for children. Not all children's literature functions this way, of course, and I'm certainly not claiming that queer theory and children's literature are identical. They are not. They are different in scope, scale, texture, history, audience, reception, and so forth. Much depends on definition and one sample materials. We can define both children's literature and queer theory traditionally, or more expansively, which shapes how we understand their relation. Um, a traditional definition of children's literature would mean literature composed for or on behalf of the young. A, broader, a somewhat broader definition would designate any and all text designed for, or appropriated by, um, and or produced maybe by children and young adults um, across multiple genres and formats and media. Um, going out of feminism, Foucault's psychoanalysis, and gay and lesbian studies, queer theory is pretty clearly a discourse for adults, at least the way it sort of formed uh, initially. It took shape in the early 1990s with the work of Judith Butler, Eve Sedgwick, David Halperin, and, and many others. Teresa de la Reta coined the term queer theory in 1991 in a special issue of the journal Differences. Soon after, however, she distanced herself from that term, saying, quote, that it had quickly become a conceptually vacuous creature of the publishing industry. <laughs> Seen more positively, uh, queer theory has come to intersect with and perhaps become indistinguishable from projects such as critical race theory, post-colonial theory, disability studies, or, or so-called quip theory, phenomenology, object oriental ontology, animal studies, various work in the post-humanities, and so on. Debate is ongoing about queer theories, life, death, and afterlife. While rooted in critique of, of heteronormativity, queer theory is no more self-evident or stable a category than children's literature. Moreover, critical and cultural theory more generally can be said to have a kind of queer function of sorts to defamiliarize and settle as strange <coughs> as much as to construct. And that means that the line between queer theory and literary and cultural theory more generally is also fuzzy. So lots of fuzzy lines here. Um, if children's literature and queer theory have significant differences, they also share a great deal. We assume that children's literature is for children and queer theory for adults, but matters aren't really so clear cut. We know that adults read and enjoy, as well as produce, children's literature. Historically, queer theory is understood as an academic practice and thus de facto for adults. But what if we use the term queer theory to designate and describe uh, a wider range of materials, including materials for children? Presumably, those materials would need to be both queer and theoretical in some sense, and so that's kind of the exploration. A primary purpose of children's literature is to educate and socialize, if not assimilate. Historically, children's literature has probably been more heteronormative than not, uh, but children's literature, as we all know very well, is a many splendid thing full of non-normative and counter-hegemonic texts, authors, genres, plots, impulses. 
It intersects with and supports traditions of progressive, even radical, I'm not looking for my switch, even radical children's literature as documented um, by scholars such as Fennell and Julian Mankenberg and many, many other people. Um, let's see. Of course, uh, there's now a substantial body of LGBT themed and mostly LGBT uh, affirmative writing. Uh, most of it published since the late 60s with some um, interesting antecedents. First clustering in the young adult novel, although not too long after moving into picture books, middle grade novels, and other genres. Uh, recent memoirs by, by um, trans adolescents, such as Aaron Andrews, um, some, uh, sorry if the image is a little fuzzy, but such as Aaron Adams, uh, some assembly required in Katie Ren Hill's Rethinking Normal, are not only queer affirmative, but also queer theoretical, I think, in their probings of normality and in their lessons for, um, for readers. Weaving in and out of this sort of proliferating out literature, and sometimes working against such, is an even larger body of material that might also be called queer, in a sense, but more old-fashioned and more kind of queer theoretical. This body of material features singular characters and or eccentric plots or kinship structures, fantastical settings, uh, time travel, other sorts of queer temporalities. And, and, you know, I'm sure that if we put our heads together, we could probably come up with a list of like 500 titles and you lean on the, the knowledge of this room. Some of this literature even used words, uses words like queer um, or eccentric or peculiar. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the term queer appears not infrequently in the titles of children's books and with a range of sort of associations and connotations, among them the strange, the fantastic, the animal, the aristocratic. Eccentric characters, as we know, are everywhere in children's literature. Mary Poppins, Pippi Longstock, in the Newman Trolls, The Cat in the Hat, Stuart Little, Jackie J. O'Malley, uh, Carnaby Spray, Godfather, Dumbledore, etc., etc. <laughs> Uh, and, and probably the whole cast of Oz, right? I mean, um, <laughs> or how about uh, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Brown's Flat Stanley, both the, uh, the character and the book. Um, and here's the Amazon sales pitch for this. This is 1964, the, the first book. Poor Stanley, he's a perfectly normal man, normal boy, until one morning he wakes up flat. After his parents peel the incriminating bulletin board off of him, Stanley must adjust to life as a pancake. He is a boy who takes this kind of thing in stride, though soon he's enjoying the, advantage, the advantages of squashiness. Um, sliding under closed doors is fun, and it's gratifying to be of use to his mother when she drops her ring through a narrow metal grating. Expensive plain fare to California? No problem. Spelt Stanley folds comfortably into a brown paper envelope. Curious or curious? <laughs> um, and the circulation of, of Stan, the flat Stan is, is probably just as interesting as the text, right? I mean, the ways that it kind of moves and then just that's a whole, I think kind of the circulation histories of text is, is, is a huge topic. Um, the cultivation of, of a hot child characters um, <coughs> persists well into our current moment, as, as with Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, uh, probably for kids exactly or only. Open question, um, or are Spiegelman's and, Fran and Francois Millie's uh, Little Lit, Strange Stories for Weird Kids, uh, Strange Stories for Strange Kids, and what about mock picture books? Mock picture books pitched solely to adults like The Fabulous Vampire, <laughs> um, or Go Them to Sleep, everybody's familiar with this, um, or <laughs> related to this, or the queer non places of imaginative, and so that actually published. Um, children's literature. Uh, <laughs> 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 there are so many of these proliferation of these kinds of titles is fascinating. Um, now, really, has been investigating the um, work. But the thing is, with this, we're actually not that far away from actual Shell Silverstein. Um, so, uh, you know, the, it's not like that project is completely wacky. I mean, there are clearly, you know, sort of books published by established children's book writers and, and illustrators that, uh, you know, seem almost to move against uh, what we think of traditionally as, as a legitimate sort of text for kids, um, and, so, and so on. Um, or what about queer adult or young adult reimaginings, uh, children's classics, lots of those, no shortage, I mean, especially us, and these endless, endless retellings, but these are just some like, a few. Uh, the larger point here being that if Jack, as Jack Halberstam has argued in the queer art of failure, children, quote, are always already anarchic and rebellious, out of order and out of time, and quote, plenty of children's books encourage that alterity. And if you know that book, she looks at Pixar as her sort of source material, and it's, it's actually a really fascinating book and persuasive, but the entire time I was reading, I think in children's literature, she gives so many more better examples of this. 
Um, you know, and so you don't need to theorize Pixar well to sort of think that there's a kind of, um, you know, sort of history, an interesting history here. Um, all of this, I think, or not a little of this literature, pushes into territory that we think of as the theoretical as well as the adult. Theorists haven't caught up with this literature. Uh, they have long been fascinated with classics like Alice and Peter Pan, uh, in part because those are fascinating texts, and in part because they're, and I think maybe largely, because they're so widely known. Um, some theorists and critics have generalized from those texts that classic children's literature is subversive, countercultural, queer, I'm thinking of Alice and Lewis, Don't Tell the Grown Ups, but there's other variations on this idea. The place of Alice and Peter Pan, and to a lesser extent, Oz and Winnie the Pooh, in critical theory is a topic all in itself, but I would note here just that some theorists even recognize uh, those texts as theory masterworks. Uh, Deleuze and Jacques Derrida have engaged at length with Alice. Uh, Deleuze going so far as to credit Alice's, um, Carol's book or books as, quote, the first great account, the first great missing scene of the paradoxes of sense, and, and quote, this is a book called The Logic of Sense, and it is a thorough reading of Lewis Carroll's body of work, not, not only the Alice books, but the other, other texts as well. Um, on the flip side, um, although much loved, Peter Pan has been associated not only with the insidious project of children's literature, but also with escapist male immaturity, um, as with Dr. Diane Kiley's homophobic self-help book, The Peter Pan Syndrome, published in 18, 1983. And I keep beating up on this book every chance I get, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the point here is the queerness of Peter Pan inspires a range of attitudes and usages, ranging from the kind of queer affirmative and the queer phobic and so on. Um, and the larger point being that Peter Pan and Alice have, are assumed to have significance and influence beyond the literary, right? And, and I was thinking more and more about this in sort of masterpieces in general, masterpiece theater in general, assumes that the texts are sort of rising above the conditions of their genre, right? That they're sort of detached from that and increasingly, and increasingly um, sort of understood as special cases. And so that's, I think that's obviously not, not always the case, or not the full story. Um, there's perhaps even an echo of Peter Pan in Andrew Butler's description of the, quote, never, never land of same-sex love in the psychic life of power. That's really more an intuition than anything else, but there's a little bit of evidence to suggest it. Uh, what happens if we pursue, so I'm finally actually getting to the argument, uh, what happens if we pursue this further and re-examine uh, queer children's literature as also or instead uh, theoretical? Consider two picture books, for example, of Becoming Animal, published long before queer theory, uh, or, I'm uh, sorry, published long before queer theory took up to lose the guitarist, interval of animal, or any critique of human exceptionalism. A personal favorite of mine is Arthur Uring's uh, Lewis the Fish, 1980, illustrated by Richard Nikigelsky. Uh, popular with adults and children alike, Lewis the Fish was a school library journal, best book of the year, and also a reading rainbow featured selection. The book tells the story of a man named Lewis, a butcher by family trade. His father was a butcher, as was his grandfather. Problem is, Lewis hates meat. Also, since he was young, Lewis has wanted to be a fish. You know, the usual. So, <laughs> After an unhappy time in human form, <laughs> after an unhappy time in human form, after feeling like a fish out of water, he turns into a fish, a salmon more specifically. Lewis soon forgot everything about being a butcher, this is the line from the book, or even about being a human being at all. After a hard life, and this is the final page, Lewis was a happy fish. <laughs> Through invented text illustrations, Lewis the Fish invites young readers to imagine a rather different state of existence from their own, and to imagine such as desirable and even normative. What if you always knew you wanted to be a fish? The text seems to ask, but you were born into the wrong kind of uh, body. What if you had nightmares about giant salamis and lamb chops? <laughs> what would you do, accept your fate and run? No, you would find some way, your body and mind would find some way to become the fish you were meant to be or were all along. Granted, the book does not tell young readers how to become a fish, uh, it offers no practical advice, but what it does do is encourage children to imagine another identity, to realize that such an identity might be possible as well as desirable. At the least, it tells the young reader that accepting one's current situation could bring more misery than happiness. Like other postmodern stories, the book reverses the usual formula of sort of identity restoration from far back into prints and so forth. Lewis stays, stays a fish. Okay, sure, but is this theory? That's kind of the question. Uh, Lewis the Fish destabilizes the young reader's expectations about desire and identity, takes the young reader to an unexpected <coughs> conclusion or resolution, 
It offers critique, poses questions. Uh, true, it does not explicitly theorize about becoming salmon or about species trouble or about uh, <laughs> compulsory humanity, compulsory humanism, I'm not sure the right word is compulsory anthropomorphism or something. Um, its lack of explicit theorizing is maybe the main thing that disqualifies the book or could disqualify the book as queer theory conventionally um, understood. Queer theory is much more explicit about the moral of a story than is contemporary children's literature. Queer theory is often openly didactic and prescriptive, uh, maybe secretly so, but, but I would say still openly. Um, and whereas contemporary children's literature prefers sort of implicit blessing, queer theory for children might therefore look different um, from queer theory for adults, a major difference being the fictionalized uh, format and the lack of explicit editorializing. I suppose it's possible to imagine a nonfiction queer theory for children gender trouble for the K-5 set. Um, no one's written anything like that as far as I know. Um, it seems reasonable, I think, in the meantime, to think of Lewis the Fish as a queer theory for children. Why not? At least it's worth playing, an idea worth playing with. Uh, another similar example, uh, perhaps, of queer theory in this imaginative form of the children's picture book is uh, as David Small's Imaging's Animators. Uh, it begins, uh, on Thursday, when Imaging woke up, she found she'd grown a pair of antlers. A queer problem, one would think, but it's no big deal for imaging. It's most everyone else who has a problem with it. She's taken to the doctor. The doctor can find nothing wrong. The school principal glares at her, offers no help. In contrast, the kitchen maid and the cook admire the antlers and do not pathologize imaging, even as, as they look forward to decorating the antlers uh, during the holidays. <laughs> um, the help, of course, being so in tune with nature and or the magical. So that's a bit of a problem, I agree. Uh, the book's not perfect, but I love how the text and illustrations revel in her difference, indulging in a kind of romanticism of alterity, uh, maybe even a, a so-called freakery. <laughs> Why do birds suddenly appear? <laughs> At the book's end, Imogen wakes up uh, antlerless, but, uh, and the family is overjoyed to see her back to normal until she returns on the last page, sporting <laughs> As with Lewis the Fish, there's a case for me here, I think, for Imogen's antlers as a, as a kind of work of queer theory, uh, one encouraging child readers to, to keep everything new. Granted, there's a streak of essentialism in the texts, including, uh, maybe especially, um, Lewis the Fish, which perhaps undercuts their radicalism and their, their potential, whereas the LGBT uh, movement pushes for political and cultural affirmation of identity, queer theory encourages, or supposed to encourage, a more provisional approach, understanding identity as mediated, constructed, contingent. That's arguably a structural intention within queer theory, um, this contestation between queer as an identity or content, why it must say a noun, and queer as an anti-essentialist, anti-foundationalist move uh, or position, uh, but more action, more and more verb. So that tension, I think, is something in queer theory that people are, are so constantly sort of reckoning with. Imogene's antlers is perhaps a queer text than Louis the Fish, if we're going to sort of push the comparison, but because the appearance of her antlers doesn't signify any particular <coughs> identity. Right, there's no sense that she really is, or really was, a moose, or a deer, uh, or so forth. Um, it's not really the point. Rather, the interval of antler upsets the order of beings. Little girls don't wear antlers, especially little girls from respectable families. I know, too, that Lewis the Fish ends not with, not with Lewis's triumph and escape into the wild, but rather his blissful domestication inside a friend's aquarium. You know, that's maybe a little disappointing, uh, although maybe it's for the best if that's his heart's desire. And it's definitely probably the safest thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it this is not absolutely about this, this uh, series. <laughs> and of course, these two texts don't deal explicitly with gender or sexuality, and so in that regard, they may seem to have little in common with first wave queer theory. Uh, even so, these and other children's books um, do, I think, the work of queer theory, if we can agree to such a thing, being able to sort of understand such a thing, interrogating normativity, visualizing, taking pleasure in difference, encouraging, uh, thinking outside the box or the aquarium, or whatever the metaphor might be. Um, another example, I think the study, Innocence, Heterosexuality, and the Queerness of Children's Literature, 2011, Tyson Pugh devotes a chapter to Lemony Snicket's, aka Dan O'Hanner's, wildly successful chapter book series, uh, a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> and of course, Hanner's had his own series of unfortunate events. So in the last 
um, year or so. So, a, a particularly interesting writer um, in lots of ways. He reads the series as playing out the tension between compulsory heterosexuality on the one hand, which is expected to be heteronormative, and compulsory innocence on the other hand, which sort of seems to contradict a little bit the idea of any sexuality. So that's the tension that, that he looks at in that, in that, and kind of makes into a theory of children's literature in general. He concludes that while it challenges uh, conventions of gender and sexuality, the Snicket series also reinforces, he says, quote, the force of predatory forms of male heterosexuality, end quote. In his view, the series is basically kind of subversive, kind of hegemonic, to paraphrase, uh, or to actually borrow Eve Sedgwick's uh, now infamous uh, phrase. She so expresses her discontent with literary criticism that basically spends a lot of energy saying, well, it's kind of hegemonic, kind of subversive. So what else can we say? Um, or can we say it differently? Um, I don't disagree with that uh, reading at all, but what if we turn the tables and approach a series of unfortunate events as kind of queer theory in disguise, in literary disguise. The first book in the series, The Bad Beginning, and nine, opens with the, this direct address to the child reader. If you, and I'm sure you know this maybe by heart in some cases, if you were interested in stories with happy endings, you would be better off reading some other book. In this book, not only is there no happy ending, there was no happy beginning and very few happy things in the middle, <laughs> end quote. The, the paragraph concludes, I'm sorry to tell you this, but that's how the story goes. This is, of course, the playful stuff of postmodern narration and fiction, but it's obviously, uh, arguably, also queer theory of the most earnest sort, actually, designed to shift expectations about story, about endings, about happy. The Bad Beginning asks the young reader to think about what she wants to read and what she really wants to read. It introduces her to the idea that we are supposed to desire happy stories, and we might, but we might actually desire things that are upsetting or even bad for us. Um, a series of unfortunate events doesn't so much queer the contemporary children's book as return it to its bad beginnings, um, recalling us to, if also ironizing, sort of cautionary tales, the whole um, genre, Puritan primers, and so forth. Excuse me. It teaches us that we are always already perverse readers. We read not only, uh, we read because of, not in spite of, the horrible things that await. Um, these, of course, are key lessons of psychoanalysis and of queer theory after it. You don't have to agree with them, but it's a common, it's a, it's a familiar idea, and I think there's probably some truth to it. Um, Snicket's protagonists, the Baudelaire children, are highly resourceful and queerish kids, an adventurer by the bookworm Klaus, um, and an, an inveterate biter, maybe um, Sunny. <laughs> you surely know the story after a series of unfortunate events, most principally the tragic death of their loving parents. The children must live with their evil relative, Count Olaf until Violet comes of age and can inherit the family fortune. Uh, the theme of the series is survival, or more particularly, the endurance uh, of adults. The predatory Olaf, especially, but also the clueless and or indifferent adults who exacerbate, um, through no hostility, typically, and just sort of cluelessness, um, and who exacerbate an already bad situation. Count Olaf has many antecedents in children's literature, but must, maybe most obviously cause out figures like Captain Hick, Reeve Voldemort, uh, but the evil is sort of sometimes comic, avuncular figures, maybe a little more so. <laughs> uh, and no future queer theory in the death drive, the Edelman reads Hook and Voldemort as victims of the culture war against queers and the affirmation or the cult of the innocent child. This is his whole critique. But the idea of the child really makes it um, very easy to sort of just say, oh, those queer uncles, we must dispose of them. It's the child, the child, the child is our future. He has a criticism of this. Uh, there's some truth to that reading, um, perhaps, and perhaps uh, Olaf is maybe the unsung queer hero of our story. I mean, that would be kind of a fun reading to develop, uh, but I, I doubt it. I probably wouldn't be too persuaded. Uh, the kids are no less queer than Olaf, who, as Pew knows, represents predatory heterosexuality, end quote. In the bad beginning, Count Olaf tries to marry the very underage Violet in a play called A Marvelous Marriage, in a, play, in a ploy to seize control of the estate. Uh, uh, Violet outwits him by signing the contract with her left hand, <laughs> by invalidating it. The left hand had lots of associations with radicality and queerness and so on. Uh, earlier, Violet uses that if we were polygamous, Count Olaf's <laughs> marriage plan wouldn't work. And so she sort of really thinks that that would have been an interesting, an interesting situation. The narrator immediately chimes in on the queerness of law and legality. This is a, another little kind of a mini editorial. I'm not sure there are sides at all. It's actually the in some ways the dominant part of the narrative, right? Unless you are a lawyer, um, it would probably strike you as odd that Count Olaf's plan was defeated by Violet signing for the left hand, so if her right. But the law is an odd thing. For instance, one country in Europe has a law that requires all its bakers to sell bread at exactly the same price. 
a certain island is a lot that forbids anyone from removing its fruit. And a, and a town not too far from where you live has a law that bars me from coming within five miles. The queerness, it's a creepy queerness, the queerness of Violet's uh, solution, he seems to say, is no queerer than the law itself, or is exactly the kind of queerness for which the law calls. This editorializing, typical of the whole series, approaches the editorializing of queer theory for grown-ups, which has a thing or two to say about the law, usually about its heteropathicity. Um, it's tempting to read a series of unfortunate events in light of the it's, It Gets Better testimonial project uh, launched by Dan Savage and his partner Terry, Terry Miller in 2010. At the level of plot, the bad beginning makes very clear that before it gets better, it gets worse, a lot worse. The series also offers lessons in irony and double meaning, typical of postmodern metafiction again, but also queer discourse and theoretical work more, more generally. The children uh, necessarily learn to speak in code. The narrator, meanwhile, recruits the reader into a sympathetic relation with formulations such as, unless you have been very, very lucky, you have undoubtedly experienced events in your life that have made you cry. Or, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but first impressions are often entirely wrong. These little sermons uh, or the comments don't always lead us where we hope they will. And the latter example, the narrator goes on to admit, in the case of Ella, first impressions are pretty much right. <laughs> on balance, though, these lessons point to the potential for happiness as well as survival, not necessarily immediate or big happiness, but a kind of strategic, situational happiness. Uh, the narrator implies that eventually things get better, and in the meantime, while the situation is bleak, there are ways to mitigate the awfulness. One way is by reading. Surprise, surprise. Uh, here's our narrator again. It is very useful when one is young to learn the difference between literally and figuratively. <laughs> if something happens, literally, it actually happens. If something happens figuratively, it feels like it's happening. If you're literally jumping for joy, for instance, it means you're leaping in the air because you're very happy. If you're figuratively jumping for joy, it means you're so happy that you could jump for joy, but you're saving your energy for other matters. <laughs> <laughs> figuratively, they escaped from Camel off in their miserable existence. They did not literally escape because they were still in his house, and blah, 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 evil in local parental space. But by immersing themselves in their favorite reading topics, they felt far away from their predicament, as if they had escaped. Is this not advice literature for child readers, some of whom might be in a difficult, if not intolerable, life situation? And is this also not queer theory, arguably, which has long been concerned with, if not motivated by, the survival of queer children? And which, I, I mean, no disrespect by saying this, can function as a kind of testimonial and self help literature. Um, I just read Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, which is a memoir, and it's sort of engaged with sort of um, queer theory, and it's very much a queer theory track, but it's, it's essentially a kind of short autobiography in five minutes, and it's incredibly powerful. There are other examples of, of I think, queer theory's forms shifting. Um, so that just came out, and so I, I recommend it. It's a really interesting book. Um, with respect to the, to the first point about queer theory's investment in, in children's survival, uh, we call that much cited lines of Eve Sedg that much cited line of Eve Sedgwick's, which is the opening line from her book, Tendencies. This is the line, a motive. I think everyone who does lesbian and gay studies is haunted by the suicides of adolescents. A little later she writes that while she's uncomfortable generalizing about people who do queer writing and teaching, she nonetheless thinks that many, quote, are trying in our work to keep faith with vividly remembered promises made to ourselves in childhood, promises to make invisible possibilities and desires visible, to make the task of things explicit, to smuggle queer representation in where it must be smuggled, and with the relative freedom of adulthood to challenge queer eradicating impulses, end quote. We might see the narrator of the Snicket books as, as a queer theorist of sorts, defining terms, making promises, smuggling in queer representation, and helping with affect management. The more I think about it, the more the bad beginning and indeed the whole series looks like queer theory for child readers. At once earning, earnest and ironic, tragic and campy, uh, instructional and imaginative, full of life lessons that are satirical, parodic, but also maybe true or persuasive. Um, if we think of a series of unfortunate events as literature, we find it lacking, or it's only literature, we find it lacking from the theoretical bands, hence the kind of, kind of subversive, kind of hegemonic reading. But if we think of it as theory, attending to style as much as to theme, some of the seeming contradictions or failures um, may make more sense. The less than progressive gender politics of the book, again, according to Pew's reading, might instead be representation of critiques. Um, at the same time, we are reminded that queer theory is just as complex and variable and idiosyncratic as imaginative literature. 
Lab group theory in children's literature involves the constructing, testing, and playing out of hypotheses. The author as queer theorist seeks to cultivate the young queer theorist by asking her, by encouraging her to ask questions, challenge wisdom, think outside the box. Um, a head of object-oriented ontology, William Stites, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble, poses the question, what is it like to be a rock? Madeline uh, Ingalls, from Point Time, asks, what does it mean to travel in time? What is time, for that matter, and how might it be wrinkled? I was so obsessed with Tesseract when I was a kid, I suspect I was not alone in that. Um, <laughs> Such literature positions the child inside and outside of text as a thinker, a problem solver, uh, or as in Freud's words, a, a little researcher. The child's theories, moreover, are often queer, as the production of knowledge requires trial and error, leaps of logic, flights of fancy. Children's literature, therefore, isn't just a resource for queer theory, but a companion project. It could even function as queer theory for queer theory if we understand theory to be something, quote, that succeeds and challenges sorry, succeeds in challenging and reorienting thinkings in the field other than those in which it originates. And that's John the color once more. If children's literature can function as queer theory, the reverse is also true. Queer theory can function as children's literature. This is maybe a somewhat harder case to make, but it's kind of a, also a fun idea to play with. I'll conclude with a few notes along those lines. Queer theory is also an archive, right? So texts, which are close to, if not sometimes themselves, works of literature. The most compelling queer theory is not only rigorous, but inspiring and even beautiful. Like literature, queer theory has its own authors, masterworks, styles, genres. Remember that queer theory emerged from creative as well as critical projects. And I, and I can't help but think, uh, you know, since I've been here, about the sort of interweaving of the creative and the, and the critical and the theoretical, which is so beautifully illustrated by the, the design of the conference as well as by, by your work. Um, queer theory emerged from that combination of the creative and the critical with, with, uh, works, with based on works such as the lesbian feminist mixed genre writing in which theory and poetics sort of cohabitate, like Witte, Blumet, Ansadula, Helene Sassou. Um, queer theory doesn't just work with literature, queer theory arguably is, is literature. Moreover, queer theory like children's literature has many functions, including some shared ones. Queer theory has two probably overarching and related tasks, critique and creation. Most obviously, queer theory offers critique, especially of sort of normativities. Queer theory, however, also dreams up new possibilities. It wills into being queer people, places, and times. Like children's literature, queer theory asks us to believe in six impossible things before breakfast. These dual energies also drive children's literature. The 18th century publisher John Newberry famously offered instruction with delight, and that phrase has now become a sort of motto for children's literature. Um, Queer theory offers the same, the willingness with its play of ideas, and its play of language, and its delivery of insight, even inspiration. And while queer theory traditionally conceived doesn't adjust the child directly, there's no reason to assume that queer theory is only for adults, or that it doesn't inhabit other forms besides the conventionally academic, in terms of the uh, academic monograph, or sort of what we think of as scholarly writing. Right? It's often said that the best writing for children comes out of an author's ongoing proximity to childhood. That same expectation seems to mark queer theory that it be of as well as for the child. While it might seem that the child is a new focus in queer theory, um, Catherine Bond Stockton's The Queer Child was the sort of the first monograph, first critical monograph on the topic, it was published in 2009. The child has, in fact, been present um, from the start in queer theory. And an example, a strange example, uh, Butler's Gender Trouble Feminism and the Subversion of Gender Identity, published in 1990, typically cited as a foundational text for queer theory. Um, not a children's book, but it does, however, have character themes and a plot with twists and turns and something like resolution and conclusion. Not only that, Butler opens the book with a portrait of the queer theorist as a young girl, describing how she learned at an early age that trouble was not something that one made, but that one was always already in. In fact, the more trouble she tried not to make, the more hopeless the cause. Trying to avoid trouble meant being in trouble. This realization gives rise to her first, quote, critical insight, this is a quote from her, into the, into the subtle moves of power. Hence, I concluded that trouble is inevitable, and the task, how best to make it, what best way to be in it, quote. I really like that. Gender trouble begins in childhood, or, or more precisely, in childhood fable. Butler recounts this anecdote not as a grounding truth, but as a narrative device, and this is Butler again. Although I have offered a childhood story to begin this preface, she writes, it is a fable, irreducible fact. 
Indeed, the purpose here more generally is to trace the way in which gender fables establish and circulate the misnomer of natural fact. Facts, end quote. Butler here presents queer theory as a kind of writing back to gender fables uh, first encountered in childhood. We might surmise not so much that the story isn't true, but rather that it is the story of everyone's childhood. We are always already in gender trouble because fables of gender, gender surround, envelop us, blurring fact and fiction. An explicitly theoretical and difficult text, gender trouble is not a children's book, but it approaches children's literature in, in multiple ways. <laughs> Let me conclude by acknowledging two problems with my talk, and I'm sure you can find more. Uh, first, I'll not mention queer theory by children, uh, except sort of publicly, although I think the possibility of such is included in many children's books. Uh, there's surely a lot uh, to say about those that are researchers, scientists, and theorists, and some advocates of childhood studies are taking up that task. And I know a number of you here are involved in childhood studies projects and are working directly with kids or looking at sort of developing projects that are sort of dealing with sort of analysis of representation, but also working with child subjects in, in various ways. Um, also, I'll admit that my argument, and yes, that, those are our quotes, um, my argument uh, not only assumes but exploits the fuzziness of queer theory. Queer theory is already criticized for being too, too diffuse and or too elastic, uh, and I'm perhaps making matters worse by confusing it with children's literature. If everything is already everything else, Perhaps there's not much point in saying so. <laughs> I'm hoping, though, that there's some value to this little thought experiment and to the general project to see in children's literature as theoretical and philosophical and not merely literary. If it doesn't kill us, maybe this kind of recent speculation will make us stronger and or stranger. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's ready for lunch. I definitely am, but I'm happy to take questions or comments or recommendations for reading or anything at all. Um, we haven't told you. Right. So, we haven't told you. <laughs> Let's not take until noon. I think, <laughs> I think we'll take some time and then we'll, then we'll refill. So, <laughs> what people can do as they need to do. So, uh, yes? Has there been a lot of um, queer theory, children's literature, inspiration as far as like people of color? Um, theory, you know, like third gender or Mahu, um, as far as a foreign um, third gender? Not, not the way we need, that's for sure. It's a huge open, uh, uh, you know, area. I mean, I think there's, I, I think there's so much to be done. I mean, I think obviously the, the kind of critique of queer theory, uh, kind of traditionally, uh, very much has unfolded along those lines. And there's been, I think, some fascinating work done, like intersections of critical race theory, post-colonial, uh, and so on, with queer theory. So I think some of the theoretical literature in general is catching up, although I think there's still a lot of blind spots. And so I think, but I think looking at it, um, you know, from the perspective of text for kids and adolescents that are um, doing that, I think it's totally rich um, sort of possibility. So I think the answer is no, yeah, not, unfortunately no, but that's one of those many things that, yes, no one's done it. You know, this, is, <laughs> this is an opportunity, and, you know, get in there and get in there and, and do it. And I'd love to hear, do you have any particular thoughts about that at this point? Are you thinking other texts or authors um, that you're kind of thinking? There's a really good documentary yeah. about uh, Native Hawaiian um, third gender, yeah. um, about Mahu, which is basically the sure. third gender for Native Hawaiians. Um, and there's lots of um, kind of third gender normalization within yeah. Samoan, Polynesian, and Native Hawaiian. Okay. So it's accepted from childhood. Yeah. And that's the only reason why I kind of bring it up. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that sounds, I'd like to know more about that. My question about um, you said smuggling queer representation into literature where it must be smuggled. Yeah. I have long felt like the pig in Charlotte's Web is a queer pig. Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> But Karen Coates is here, she can, uh, she, she's an expert here, she is, if she was here, but she, she yeah, she's, she's our source on Charlotte's Web, and, and, but yeah, that's interesting. What, what made you have that, that well, kind of? For one thing, it was typical in illustrations with the anthropomorphism to okay. give um, animals long eyelashes if they were feet, oh, if they were okay. female, and so. he has very long eyelashes in the um, illustrations, and I know that um, he worked E.B. White worked closely with the illustrator, but yeah. also it actually says he looked 
so cute. Mm -hmm. And that is a word that you like rarely and ever, you know, like right. I think twice in anything that you've written, you yeah. could use the word cute. He looks very cute in his That's doll carriage, and he's put in the doll carriage. <laughs> and um, he becomes the, the mother yeah. of the baby spiders at the end. And yes. So when you think about Absolutely. that, before yeah. you read it, you'll start to pick up a lot of Absolutely. There's, there's been, I can tell you, there's been wonderful um, feminist and um, analysis and queer theoretical analysis of, of you know, Charlotte Swift on Lucy Rollins, the reproduction of mothering. One of the, one of those, sort of her analysis of the idea of the reproduction of mothering, she talks about some of those things. And I think it's, it's fascinating because um, clearly, this is the, both the strength and the weakness of queer theory is the blurring of the queer with the singular, the eccentric, the strange. I mean, I think that's, we can exploit it, that's wonderful, but all people say, okay, but what, how is that different from the peculiar and the singular and the strange? So, well, it is, it isn't. And I think, um, and there are a lot of probably um, animal characters who uh, play out uh, sort of unconventional, what we think of as maybe unconventional gender sort of roles, uh, you know, um, the pacifist bull, right? And I mean, all kinds of, all kinds, yes, written it, exactly. So, uh, so I, have, I haven't thought about Wilbur's specifically um, as queer per se, but I could see, uh, I, I, right now I'm, I, I believe in making a case for everything. <laughs> and then just sort of see what see what uh, happens, and uh, and then if, you know, if it turns out not to be as persuasive or as useful, as I have maybe a little bit of a pragmatic sort of thing about this, like what's actually useful for having conversations with people about you know what are your expectations <laughs> about say the gendering of animals or the gendering of uh, characters in books for younger younger readers. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about Wilbur or about. Um, I'm not trying to pick on Karen, but I just know she, she's done some of those brilliant work on that on that book, and um, I know you talk a little bit about some of this. Well, it's, I mean, he's he's. I think he falls more into that polymorphous. I mean, yeah. which is a which is a queer space, right? Right. Um, but he gets the. I like the quote of the child is father to the man, because of its. Um, we tend to gender through yeah. the patriarchy. Yes. The child is a non-gender construct who, in the course of that sentence, becomes a gender thing yeah. as an adult. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think the case to be made for Wilbur has to do more with the polymorphous indecidability of a child, and it carries through in Babe too. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking. Too, yeah, too. because at, at, especially the film, yeah. where um, it's bit, there's no, I don't think there's any pronouns in that. Hmm. That, that's that gender being. That's fascinating. Yeah, just and just the, uh, the critique of, of uh, violence and of, of, the, of mm -hmm. murder and the whole. I mean, thinking about sort of, especially looking at it from the perspective of kind of a queer posthumanism and queer animal studies. Mm -hmm. um, which I'd be very interested to kind of go back and look at some of those classic tests because I think that is partly what makes him queer is that he doesn't want to die. And uh, well, who doesn't have that particular? <laughs> <laughs> So maybe a very select moments, but um, yeah, I think that that's a kind of um, and there's something about that. It's interesting that you know you're not, I'm not going to participate in this narrative, which has been sort of normalized and you know made into a heroic narrative. And just I, I, that, I think that'd be really really interesting to think more about. So yeah, thank, thank you for that. It's a great great question. Great observation. Uh, uh, yes. Hi, I'm a writer with absolutely no background in theory, so I'm wondering. That makes you if, perfect. This is this way. I think so. <laughs> but but I, and I know I can ask this question to Karen later. But I, I, since you're here, I'd love to ask it of you. Okay. Um, I, if you could back up a little bit, because I didn't yeah. understand your basic premise, okay. which was, I understand that adults can engage in queer theory with damn near anything, but. How are you, is what you're saying that you expect children to engage with queer theory, with, with books that read? How, how do yeah. they do that in, in real life? Yeah, I would say they do it all the time, actually, in real life. The, the, the child readers and subjects in children's books. So, I mean, the, the basic idea was to sort of take a particular academic uh, project, which is kind of queer theory, which was sort of came out of um, sort of feminist theory and some other forms of analysis that look at kind of especially the expectation that everyone's going to be straight, married, want to have kids, all those kinds of things. And so there's a, that looking at that body of materials and saying, what else looks like that? And my first answer was a lot of children's books look like that, uh, to me at least. I mean, some of the, some of the um, examples I gave, I think, show that there are storylines where um, you know, characters and then the readers of those books are being encouraged to sort of think twice 
about, um, say, wanting to, to be a butcher or wanting to, uh, or, or being freaked out by waking up with having something physically new about you. So, yeah. How does that differ from the basic and long-held premise that children's literature is subversive? Yeah, I don't think it does. I'm just mapping it on top of it? I think, I think it's a version. I think, I think it's a, that's a great way to put it, and I think it's a sort of, um, it's a sort of, uh, I don't know if even update it's quite fair. So it's a variation on that argument. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'd like to think maybe it's a little bit more, um, Elusive, but that may not necessarily be a good thing. <laughs> I mean, but it, that is, it does go back to that, and there are people in Alison Lurie's claim about that, and she basically says there's this tradition of radicality. It's interesting because I think, in terms of thinking about children's literature in general, like there are two big giant hypotheses. One is that one children's literature is subversive, there's this radical thing. And there's also children's literature is hegemonic, it's creating normal, you know, it's reinforcing everything that's normal about, quote unquote, normal about the world. But the truth is probably somewhere in between, and it's a mix of those things, and I think probably a lot of you are doing, including you, are doing like a really interesting work about thinking about what your kids need to grow and learn and develop and, you know, and, what, and give them options right, that they may not necessarily think about. Um, and so I think that's, that's why the work's so important. But I think, I, I think my, my particular uh, momentum, my particular uh, impulse came from, we have this whole interesting academic conversation that's not actually reaching anybody else. And this is pretty an unusual problem with academia, for better and for worse, it, it has its own particular culture. There are a lot of great things about that, and I don't think every conversation needs to reach everybody necessarily. I think it's, you know, but I do think there's lots of great tools here and lots of great points here. And then I look at this body of work um, for kids and teenagers and think there's so much there that you know really can be um, that can be worked with in this way. And so, uh, and so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's an interesting question because maybe you can't say, oh, let's not do that. Let's just let it do, quietly do its work <laughs> of, of, of subversion or at least countering the sort of, you know, I don't know, the reinforcement of what we think of as sort of uh, traditional sort of, I don't know, patriarchal values and traditional racist values. I mean, there, there, there might be an argument to letting that work continue to happen below the surface. I don't know. One of the things that some of the scholars of radical children's literature have said is, is they've said, well, one of the reasons why these people could do this work was because no one was paying any attention to children's literature. <laughs> so you have this like, traditional leftist, socialist um, writing, for example, for kids, pro labor writing for kids. It was kind of flying under the radar, you know, right in the middle of the McCarthy era and before that. So, uh, you know, I think there, there is some, there is some uh, persuasiveness to the idea that smuggling in, sneaking in, plus it's kind of sexy, because let's just see what we can do, you know, on the sly. Uh, and because, you know, I think we, we, most of us like to deal with levels of meaning and levels of text, and so, you know, we may not necessarily want to hunt for the subtext all the time, but the idea that language is rich and multidimensional is appealing to us. So maybe there's something to be said for that rather than bringing it more to the surface. It's a great, it's a great uh, uh, open question, I think. And I'm not sure I know how, how I feel about it, but uh, yeah. So I, I've been long looking at various literature and theoretical contexts, and um, I'd like to hear your opinion on the absorptive response in academia to literature as theory, um, or do we, are we continuing to play out um, utilitarian use of the work? Can someone, I'm going to go check out the whole question. Tell me my, sorry, I'm hearing impaired, and I can use it pretty good with my devices, but I missed it. I'll much. try again. Yeah, that'd be great. Could you project louder or someone can read it? Yeah. Sorry. I okay, so. <laughs> 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 Anyone who's not in the academic world, yes. can you talk about the absorptive response in academia um, to to literature as theory, or do we keep enacting utilitarian means? Mm, and you mean in terms of a strategy, or what we actually do at the moment? What we should do, or what we are doing? Maybe a little um, bit, or? <laughs> So, in academia, yeah. do you see changes happening right. in response to this idea of okay. literature as okay. theory, yeah. or do we just keep utilizing it? Right. That's a great. That's a great question. I'm sorry it took me a couple of versions to get it. My, but my hearing is is um, it's not what it ought to be. Thank you. Um, I think it's a great question. I don't know if I have an answer. Probably a lot of you have um, perspectives on that. Um, I because I'm mostly optimistic by nature. Maybe maybe um, 
little too much, so I, I, I feel like I do see some, some change in that. I feel like I, I mean, one of the conversations that's being forced right now is just what should scholarship look like? That's never been, uh, you know, that's never been obviously a static idea, but I think the real pressure is on it now, especially with the wretched job in market and uh, academia and so on. Now, does that mean that suddenly, you know, Michigan and Harvard and even Florida are saying, oh, you know, don't worry about that dissertation. Just, um, you know, do something different or you can just totally do it from that. No, of course, there's still, there's still, I think, fairly, uh, uh, and in some ways I think it's fine, it might even be good, but there's sort of expectations about what a discipline is and what it means to learn, uh, you know, a content and a methodology and, and to work with that. Um, but I do think, I see dissert the dissertation changing, for example. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, 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 the idea of a creative dissertation has always seemed uh, both curious and, and completely redundant, right? Because, uh, and, then, and I've actually heard a lot of people here think, well, I don't think of myself as creative, but actually, I think maybe the work I do is creative. And critical work is very creative. Uh, you know, we make stuff up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> After rigorous research, of course. And, uh, and, but I mean, there is a kind of, and, and the pleasure in that, and that's actually one of the things I like about queer theory as a, as a body of theoretical text, is that there's a kind, of, especially with subject, there's a kind of real, like, isn't this fun and interesting and fabulous? You can really feel that pleasure, and she, she kind of has it on display. I love that. So I don't know. I mean, I think these, the, the cultures change slowly. Um, and I, what's your sense? I mean, have you seen any when you've been looking at, uh, I mean, for example, the, the Argonauts, the book I just mentioned, she is a queer theory quick person, but she's also, you know, I think she went to MacArthur, and she's published a number of sort of interesting books that are kind of unconventional. This is Maggie Nelson, uh, in unconventional format. And The Argonauts is a kind of uh, work of queer theory, but it's also a memoir. It's very personal in some ways. It's very abstract and theoretical in other ways. Um, and it's kind of gorgeous, actually. And she's like a really good writer, uh, I think. I mean, and I found it really moving. And, it's, and it's, it's probably about the experience of being a queer woman who is involved with a, a trans man and then also getting pregnant and having a baby and what that means and sort of like assumptions about mothers and assumptions about you know about gender and assumptions about academic versus the personal and it's really a pretty interesting exploration so now you know it's not like any of us can just produce that and say this will work for my tenure case or this is the one that we want to take to MLA so I think, I think there you know there are real uh, pressures that still exist on the forums so I think I'm, I'm kind of talking my way around uh, answering the question, but uh, I, think, I think it's definitely, the, the conventions are still there. I'd like to think there's more openness. I think some of it, frankly, may be forced uh, on, on the, um, well, I don't know. It's, universities will continue to exploit people as long as they can. I should say that, but it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily, though, not so us, but yes, the people who are high up and are trying to manage their budgets, and like, you know, labor can be cheap, and there's always supply of people. It's a huge problem, obviously, as we all know. And therefore, you don't get teachers who are engaged, and you don't get there's all kinds of dysfunction that can come with this. And so, um, you know, in, in a way, I think they're going to just not worry about this at all. But part of me also thinks, um, you know, given all these things, uh, the current conditions can't stand. I mean, it can't, they, especially in terms of funding and how long you're funded in a graduate program. You know, you can't be in school forever. I don't think that was ever really true, but now, especially with the loans skyrocketing and the fact that something like 20 or 25 percent of faculty positions are, are a tenure track in the ones that are listed. I mean, it's pretty devastating. And I, I'm sorry to be telling uh, you out about that, but I'm not telling you anything you don't know, probably. It's a pretty pretty grim situation in terms of academic jobs. I mean, what I like about talking to all of you is that it reminds me how many careers are possible and what sorts of combinations of things can be done. Um, so, I don't know. It's, I think there are, I'd like to think some of these changes will come about because the academy has to change in response to social and economic pressures. But, it may not necessarily change in ways that let us, you know, uh, mix up the forums. I mean, I, some of the organizations are finally coming around to, gosh, the dissertation maybe needs to be looked at differently. Or what do we do with digital scholarship? What do we do with sort of publication online? I mean, the digital humanities movement is there, but even there you start to see kind of some standard ideas about what scholarship is sneaking back in because of anxieties about authenticity and your legitimacy. Oh, that's way too long. I'll stop on that. But yes. <laughs> I can talk loud. Can you hear me? <laughs> That's pretty good. Case, I can so. predict. Um, so you were talking about how the conversation is staying within the critical community. Yeah. I feel you must know about Lee Wynn's blog. 
Um, I don't, um, actually. No. He has a blog called I'm Here, I'm Queer, What the Hell Do I Read? Ah, okay. Oh. <laughs> that, and, right. okay. Yeah. Are you familiar with that? I've heard that. I swear that title is familiar, but maybe I'm just imagining it. So, yeah, but tell me more about it. Well, I mean, he, he's uh, very active with the Society of Children's Book Writers okay. and Illustrators, okay. and it is catering towards kids who are LGBT. Okay. Um, he interviews transgender children about uh, once a month or once a week yeah. on his blog. Um, just trying to bring the conversation you're starting Absolutely. into the more public domain. Well, and actually, I, I should say, you're completely right, and I, I'm not starting this conversation and joining it. It's been ongoing, mm -hmm. and you are quite right. There's an extensive, I know that um, there are all kinds of people in uh, libraries and teaching and, and, you know, uh, people, teachers, and as well as writers, who are very engaged in this kind of general project, of not only supporting queer identified youth, but also just trying to push those, those push the envelope and push those those um, frontiers further along. So, yeah. So, I, I, I that's, and that's probably what I think you're asking about, right? About is this staying within, you know, this kind of uh, yeah. academy, or do we have this sort of um, movement outside? I think there are a lot of great examples, and I think the resources, well, are kind of quite remarkable. Um, and I think that's affecting what the novels that are getting um, published and written and the kinds of spaces that are being imagined, yeah. even within uh, a sort of, you know, typical a codex, a sort, of a, you know, a sort of physical book. So, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that reminder as well. And I'll also check out the, I'll check out the blog a little more, uh, a little more um, sort of, <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments or yes, please? My ears are having a hard time keeping up with your mouth because you talk so fast. And when you started talking about the, um, the It Gets Better project, yes. I didn't quite catch one. It's uh, so just. I, you know, I know about it. Oh, you do. You saying that it's. Um, I was saying I was thinking that uh, the whole there's been there's been a lot of praise of it, a lot of critique of it. It's been kind of in the spotlight, as you know. And I was thinking uh, that an awful lot of the um, sort of interior language of the Snicket books is kind of a version of that, somewhat cynical at times, but a kind of like. Um, it seems to me there's a little bit of a lifeline being thrown in some of these children's books, and people say, okay, things kind of suck for you, and if you can hang in there, you're probably going to survive this. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to come out necessarily, you know, with this amazing life at the end, but, you, but you, there are going to be pleasures and joys that await. So I'm sort of seeing some of that same language in there, so that's why I was thinking of it, of it together, because I think it has had a pretty big, there's been a lot of criticism of it as well. Um, what is the criticism? Um, I think you know mostly that it becomes this narrative about about opt optimism, that sort of blind optimism, and also that your the reason why things suck for you might be things like structural poverty, racism, mm -hmm. things that you're not. It's not just about low power. So, so I think some of it's just been a kind of um, sense that it's it tells too much of a simplistic story. And the other thing is that it's become a little bit of a, of a cultural fetish, and so a lot of people sort of jumping in onto the bandwagon and, and adding their stories to the story. And a lot of times they've been by very um, successful them as well for people, and so people say, well, okay, sure, that's lovely for you, but like, what does it mean to attack the side? There have been other kinds of uh, criticisms, but I mean, any project that big is going to have, I think, that kind of conversation. And, and actually, Savage and Philip have been very clear about saying, we like the dialogue. Then all this weird everything, but it's been, it's been, you know, it's been actually a kind of, mostly a positive experience, I think. So, um, I don't know. I, mean, I, think, I think there is a kind of it gets better message, even if it's sort of sarcastic, <laughs> even as it's sort of playful and ironic and other things, you know, uh, it seems to still be there. Um, and, um, you know, I think the survival, the, the survival for this is actually really important. I can't help but, you know, I, I, we, we definitely had a number of uh, papers and stories this morning that were very much about this and, and, and thinking about what do we mean by trauma, how do we survive it, what does it mean to survive, uh, under what terms, right? So I thought it was really a lovely kind of confluence of, of things there. And I think that's, that's basically what that project is, is doing with. And I think it is about giving a voice as well. And it invites people to create their own materials and upload them, and so I think there's that as well. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, all right, well, I think that might be lunchtime. Yes, okay. Thank you very much.